Amen. The best thing I can say about this day is that the Lord made it. The longer I study, the longer I live, the more I realize that absolutely anything and everything in creation is absolutely and completely controlled by him. Amen. That's why we call him Almighty God. I want you to turn with me now this morning to the book of Genesis, chapter number 3. Father, bless this word now, Lord. Give me the gift of teaching. In thy name I pray, amen. All right. Let's see here. Okay. It's ridiculous when you get to where you can't even, your hands shake so much when you try to do something. All right, Genesis 3, 1. The serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden? The woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. The serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die. Therefore sin existed before the man existed. That's important. That's important. Uh, sin existed before the man existed. The reason that we have death passed upon us is because Adam sinned. And we are of Adam. Therefore, this death was passed upon each of us. But here in the book of Genesis, chapter number 3, it's important to understand something. And I know how things happen. They evolve. They, they change over time. Uh, you have, uh, have an ocean, and then people build on that. They never bother to study. For example, you've seen a tree with a snake in it, a snake curled around that tree. And that's supposed to be the serpent of Genesis, chapter number 3. And then, of course, it goes on, and there are those who teach that the apple was the forbidden fruit of Genesis chapter number 3. The Hebrew word translated uh, serpent here in Genesis chapter number 3, the serpent was more subtle, is nachash. And that's the way you say it in Hebrew. It's a rough breathing. And it means a shining, brilliant thing. And that's about as far as we can go with it. But it's something that catches the attention because of its beauty. It's great beauty. So therefore, Eve was lured into sinning against God by the beauty that she saw. Now that word, that Hebrew word nachash, is used all over the New Old Testament. And it's used in different ways. Look at, uh, look at the book of, uh, of uh, Numbers chapter 21 and verse 8. Numbers 21.8. And the Lord said to Moses, Make thee a fiery serpent, and set it upon a pole, and it shall come to pass, that every one that is bitten when he looketh upon it shall live. Therefore Moses made a serpent of brass. He made a nachash. That's what he did. He made a brilliant, shining thing. And by this time, by this time, it was something that could be wrapped around a pole. But the reason for that is because of the curse that was placed upon it. You'll go back to Genesis chapter number 3 and you'll see where he cursed this creature and he said upon your belly you're going to crawl. Now that's important. And uh, he's, the reason it's important is because it tells you why that, uh, that the serpent was taken from an angel of light, which it appeared to be. I want you to go over here, look at Genesis chapter number 3, verse 14. Genesis 3, 14. And the Lord God said to the serpent, Because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle 
and above every beast of the field, upon thy belly shalt thou go, and dust shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. All right, now this is the curse upon your belly. Now I want you to go with me to the book of 2 Corinthians, chapter number 11 and verse number 3. 2 Corinthians 11, 3. Second Corinthians chapter 11, verse 3. Now look at, uh, look at this text very closely. But I fear, lest by any means, as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. You see that? Verse 14, Second Corinthians 11. No marvel. For Satan himself is, and this is the important part, transformed. This is what we need to understand about the nature of Satan. He is transformed into an angel of light. Satan's a spirit being. Cherubim, seraphim, angels, and like are spirit beings. God is a spirit. We, here's the problem. I honestly believe that we try to make it too simple when it comes to dealing with spirit beings. A spirit being is a being that is unlike, you, you can't see it with your eye. It is invisible. Therefore, if you do see something with your eye, it means that that spirit has materialized where you can see it. And by doing so, it comes in whatever fashion it pleases. So it can deceive you or lead you astray. Now, when Satan shows up in the Bible, it's important to understand that he has a reason for being here in Genesis 3. If you look carefully at it again, you'll see that the Lord said to Satan, because you have done this thing. Look at this. Genesis chapter number 3, verse number 14. The Lord God said to the serpent, the Nachash, because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle, and above every beast of the field, upon thy belly shalt thou go, and dust shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. He's cast down to the ground. He wasn't before. He was up walking on it. Now he's cast down to it. And if you notice carefully what he said here, because you've done this. What do you mean this? It's because he had a personal animosity toward the first Adam, the first man. You see, sin had already come into existence before the first man was ever made. All right, where to come in? You have to ask yourself this question, what happened? See, what happened? What happened to the earth before Adam showed up in it? And what, what, what's the issue going on here? And there's a lot of thought in that. There's a lot of ways that people look at that and interpret it. But I do firmly believe that Satan's downfall from his place of exalted position, look at Ezekiel 28 and you'll see what I'm talking about. Ezekiel chapter number 28. Verse number 11. Ezekiel 28, 11. Moreover, the word of the Lord came to me saying, Son of man, take up a lamentation upon the king of Tyrus and say unto him, All right. You remember what we learned in the New Testament about, about uh, John the Baptist? What did the Lord say about John the Baptist? He said, this is Elijah if you'll receive him. See what I mean? Well, John the Baptist was not physically Elijah, but he could have become the fulfillment of the prophecy of Elijah. Therefore, God can speak into a spiritual thing and use a human being as a, as, as, I don't know, as a reference point. Maybe that's the best way to put it. And this is what's happening here. Liberal scholarship says that the king of Tyrus is who's being addressed here. It's a human being. It has nothing to do with a spirit being in the whole 28th chapter of the book of Ezekiel. I don't believe that for a minute. Why? Well, keep reading. Son of man, take up a lamentation from the king of Tyrus and say to him, Thus saith the Lord, Thou sealest up the sun, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. Remember the Nachash, beautiful creature? Thou hast been in Eden, 
the garden of God. Now, wait a minute. Wait just a moment here. When was he in Eden, the garden of God? It's obvious that he's referring back to a time in the past that no king of Tyrus could ever fulfill that scripture, right? Every precious stone was thy covering, the sardis, topaz, diamond, the barrel, the onks, jasper, sapphire, emerald, and the carbuncle and gold, the workmanship of thy tablets and thy pipes was prepared in thee in the day that thou wast created. So who, what's going on here? Well, this is a created being, and he has been in Eden. And now look at verse 14. He gets more specific with him. Thou art the Mashiach. Cherub, that's what the word Mashiach means, anointed. The Mashiach is the Messiah, and that's who that, uh, that the Jewish, a uh, lot of the Jews, are looking forward to the coming of the Mashiach. They reject the Lord Jesus Christ as being the Messiah, all right? And this is what the Bible talks about, the Lord's Christ over there in the book of Psalm, because there's more than one Christ, and there's... Now look at verse 14. Thou art the anointed cherub that covereth. What does this mean? Well, you look up that word covereth, and it literally means that he's a high, exalted, and lifted up one that's over all of the creation. And look at uh, verse number 13 again. What is this? Thy tabrets and thy pipes prepared in thee in the day that thou was created. Well, he's a leader of music. He's a musician. He's a musician. You go back to the book of Genesis and you'll find that the first musicians were of the line of Cain, the one who made musical instruments. Therefore, music is something that God gave us to worship God with. For the Bible says the angels sang. They rejoiced. And the music, therefore, can either be satanic or it can be of God, one or the other. Satanic or of God, and I hate to say this today, but about 90% of everything pumped out around us is satanic. It's satanic, pure Satan. But he said in verse 14, Thou art the anointed cherub that covereth. Now we go back and we look at the book of Ezekiel and we find cherubs mentioned. We go back to the book of Genesis. And what was it that he placed with a flaming sword in front of the tree of life to keep it? Cherub. <laughs> cherub, therefore, shows up in the Bible in specific locations and places for specific reasons. There's five of them in the Bible, five cherubim. And these cherubs are angelic or spirit creatures. A lot of folks just give a generic term and say they're angels like the seraphim and the rest of them. Uh, you use a generic term and you can say they're angelic. In plain words, they are of the heavens in that sense. But a cherubim is not an angel. A cherubim is a unique creature inside the holy of holies. The holiest place on this earth was not a seraph. It was not an angel. It was a cherubim. And one on either side of the mercy seat with their wings touching, looking down upon that mercy seat. And, of course, the mercy seat's a type of Christ. The cherubim had, therefore, unique access, unique access to the holiness and presence of God that, uh, that it appears the others didn't. For example, over there in the book of Isaiah, chapter number 6, when the, board, when the Bible says that I saw the Lord high and lifted up in the year that King Uzziah died, the leprous king, there's a contrast here, comparison. This is what it's, what's happening. To show you how filthy and low the king was compared to how high and holy God is. And the seraphs, and the word Hebrew word seraph simply means to burn. The burning ones, a ball of fire, came flying forth from him because they could not, apparently they couldn't take that holiness when it began to manifest itself to such a degree they simply cried, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. And they took coals off the altar and purged Isaiah the prophet. That's a seraph. Seraphim, when you, hit, when you get into theme, em, you get into the eems in Hebrew, you get into plural, okay? Cherubim, plural. Seraphim, plural. Elohim, plural. And what's Elohim used for in the Old Testament? God, but not just God. 
An Elohim is a spirit being that could be sons of God. So we find over here in the book of Ezekiel 28, thou, hast, uh, thou wast upon the holy mountain of God and walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. So he had an exalted position, and this holy mountain of God is not a mountain on this earth. This is high and lifted up. This is where he has his access to the third heaven. The reason God made the third heaven is so it would be a place where his creatures that are the closest to him and the holiest could have access in a limited degree to him, the third heaven. This is where John was caught up to in the book of Revelation. He was caught up into the third heaven and he had access to a place he could never have access before. The third heaven, second heaven, and first heaven. The first heaven you're living in right now, and you're breathing the air, the first heaven. The second heaven is where the Hubble telescope is sending us pictures back of this beautiful creation uh, at the hand of the creator. I hope my, with all my soul, you do not believe at all that beauty out there and all that order. And all of that just exploded one day and became what it is now. I'll tell you what, if you believe that, your brain has exploded. Amen. Not that. <laughs> Amen. I look out there and I say, my, 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 what a creator. Oh, yeah. He can create beauty. Um, unbelievable. And do you know something? There's beauty all over this world that a man's never seen. You know why? He didn't make the beauty for the man. He made it for himself. <laughs> that it manifest his glory. Amen. His righteousness. So, he said in verse number 15, Thou wast perfect in all thy ways from the day thou wast created till iniquity was found in thee. Now, this gets into a mystery, okay? God knew this was going to happen. He knew it. No question about it. He knows all things. He knew it was going to happen. Therefore, this anointed cherub that covereth has a place in the purpose of God. A place in the purpose of God. Uh, it's not like... One day God uh, lost control and all of a sudden this thing came into being. No, no. But let me give you something now this morning to think about. And I've mentioned this in here before, but it's very good to go back and look at it again. The Bible says over here in the book of Ezekiel chapter number 28 that he was the anointed cherub that caught, that, uh, that, that, uh, the anointed cherub that covereth. Okay, where are we? First heaven, second heaven, or third heaven? We're in the third heaven here. Okay, we're in the third heaven, the holy mountain of God, third heaven, verse 15, perfect in all thy ways, third heaven. So what happens in verse number 18? Thou hast defiled thy sanctuaries by the multitude of thine iniquities, by the iniquity of thy traffic. Therefore will I bring forth a fire from the midst of thee, and I will bring thee to ashes upon the earth in the sight of all them that, befo all them that behold thee. And they that know thee among the people shall be astonished at thee, and thou shalt be a terror, and never shalt thou be any more. Now, how are we going here? Go back to verse 15 and watch the way the scripture changes. We're looking at the cherub. Now, watch at this, verse 15. Thou wast perfect in all thy ways from the day thou wast created till iniquity was found in thee. By the multitude of thy merchandise, thou hast filled the midst of thee with violence, and thou hast sinned. See the sinning? Therefore will I cast thee as profane out of the mountain of God, and I will destroy thee, O covering cherub, from the midst of the stones of fire. What is this? This is Satan being cast out of the third heaven. Third heaven. This is the first casting down and the first judgment upon him. He's cast out of the third heaven. Verse 17. Thine heart was lifted up because of thy beauty. Thou hast corrupted thy wisdom by reason of thy brightness. And I will cast thee to the ground. I will lay thee before kings that they may behold thee. Now, what are we looking at here? Here's what we're looking at. We're looking at one that was cast out of the third heaven, Satan, cast down to the second heaven. And here... We read in chapter number 28 of Ezekiel, we're going into a man. He therefore incarnates himself into a man on this earth. Just like God incarnated himself as a man, Satan incarnates himself into a man. 
And the man that he incarnates himself into is the Antichrist. He's the beast. And look carefully at this. Thou hast defiled thy sanctuaries by the multitude of thy traffic, by the iniquity of thy traffic. Verse number, uh, verse, verse 18, jump a little bit. I will bring thee to ashes upon the earth in the sight of all them that behold thee. Have you read in the book of 1 Thessalonians where it talks about the Lord shall destroy this wicked antichrist with the spirit of his coming, the brightness of his coming? He'll destroy him, all right? That means that this man, that's, he's, he's walking around right now. I firmly believe that amongst us. He's here. He's going to destroy this man in the presence of all of his followers, in the presence of all those that worship him at the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ when he comes back in power and glory and brightness. And this brightness will concentrate itself on this thing, this beast, and his body will be brought to ashes in their presence, but the beast himself will be cast into the lake of fire. According to the scripture, when Satan is bound for a thousand years and put in the bottomless pit, before that happens, the Antichrist will be brought to ashes in the visible presence of all them that worship him. And there will be a thousand years of millennium on this earth of peace when the Son of God reigns from Jerusalem. While he's reigning from Jerusalem, Satan is bound in the bottomless pit and the Antichrist and the false prophet, according to Revelation 13, will be in the lake of fire for a thousand years. Then in the after the tribulation period, the great white throne judgment, after the millennium, tribulation, then millennium, after that, Satan will be turned loose at the end of the millennium and he'll go out and he'll deceive the nations again and he'll cause them to rise up in rebellion against God. And the Lord will put down the final rebellion, the final rebellion, he'll put it down. And when he does, Satan will be taken and cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are. They've been there a thousand years. This is what's going to happen. This is my interpretation of the text. In the book of Ezekiel chapter number 28, he said, I will bring thee to ashes upon the earth in the sight of all them that behold thee. You cannot bring a spirit being to ashes. When your soul dies, folks, you're, you're a human being, body, soul, and spirit. When your body dies, if you're unsaved, your soul dies. That's the second death. And if you are unsaved, then your soul descends into the heart of the earth. It goes down to where hell is right now. And there you are, all right? You're in a place that burns, burns 24-7. It doesn't cease burning, but it doesn't burn you up because you're a spirit being. Therefore, you continue in existence in a place of suffering and torment. God help us. Nobody with any sense wants to go to a place like that. But that's where you go if you leave here unclean. All right, this is what we're talking about with a spirit being. God is spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Now, I want you to look at something in the Bible here. This is important. This context is very important. Look at uh, Numbers. We read about him making this thing, okay? He made this, he made this seraph. Now, look at the book of uh, 2 Kings chapter 18, verse 4. 2 Kings 18, 4. Second Kings 18, 4. He removed the high places and break the images and cut down the groves. Now watch this. And break in pieces the brazen serpent that Moses had made for unto those days the children of Israel did burn incense to it and he called it Nehushtan the wicked brazen thing now, wait a minute that's the very thing he used out there if they looked at it they could be healed you remember that when they were bitten by fiery serpents you remember that 
All they had to do, God said, Moses, raise up a serpent on a pole. And, and, he, and the Lord said, if they just look, they don't have to touch that. Just look. If they're bitten, they can be healed. They can be saved, in other words. They can be healed. Did it work? Of course it worked. So what did they do? They kept it. Now, here's the great spiritual lesson to learn in this. After hundreds of years of keeping this thing, it had become an idol to them. And they were burning incense to it. It had become to them a representation of a spiritual thing. And they were burning incense to it. Okay? It, it, was, it was in a holy place. It was exalted. It was a thing, though. A thing that had been made. All right? Here's the lesson the Lord taught them. You've got this thing now, and you've got it in a place, and you're burning incense to it. But it can't help you. And the reason it cannot help you is because it's a thing. You see, what it represented when it was lifted up in the wilderness was the one behind it who was ready to do for them by simple faith, believing in what could happen if they looked at it. See? And the Lord Jesus said to them when he was here 2,000 years ago, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. All right? The cross, I've got crosses, you've got crosses, cross fine. Got no problem with crosses. I think cross can be a good thing. But that cross cannot save you. You need to understand that. It's what it represents. That's what saves you. In plain words, if that cross can be used to focus your mind on the one who died on that cross, then that's where the power comes from. That's where salvation comes from. And so the Nehushtan that was, in, the, that was in, a, in, a, in a holy place, a sacred place, they had turned it into an idol, and God had nothing to do with it. In plain words, there would be nothing about it that he would approve of. You see? Nothing. Even though maybe something had been good before with it, and it had been, but it had reached the point to where nothing good would ever come of that thing anymore. And, of course, what happened when they had a revival in the place they broke it to pieces and got rid of it. This is what happens when somebody with spiritual discernment comes in. They, they, we have a, you know, it's, this is the truth. We have a tendency to make idols out of things and not even notice when we're doing it. We do. We make idols out of them. And, and the Bible says plainly that when the Gentiles sacrificed to idols, they sacrificed to devils. Paul said the idol is nothing. You carve it out of a piece of wood. A piece of stone, it's still stone, it's still wood. It's still the same thing it was before you carved it. That's all it is, that's all it'll ever be. But when you get down in front of it, and you begin in your spirit and in your soul to cry out to that thing, God's not in that thing. And so a spirit answers you from that thing. And the spirit that answers you from that thing is an evil spirit. It's a demon. It's that simple. That's the way it works today, to this very day. Quija board's the same way. Quija board's nothing. But if you sit down with it and you put your hand upon it, and even whatever they do, I've never had one. Thank God, probably would have if I hadn't had any sense, but never had one. But whatever they do with that Quija board, it begins to answer them. They ask it a question, and then they somehow or another they put their hands on something, and it begins to answer them, and it gets their attention because, good night, this thing's alive. And that's where they get sucked into the spirit world by dealing with something that can lead them. It is, a piece of wood is not, is not demon-possessed. But what that piece of wood represents can lead them into that world. And that's what happens here. A good thing. While it was in the wilderness, all they had to do was look at it. And they'd be saved. They'd be healed on the spot. But later on, it became an idol. It became an idol. And in that, it led, them, it led them wrong. So 2 Kings chapter 18 is good to remember. It's very good to remember because it teaches us a great lesson. Now I'm going to give you the falls of Satan, Satan falling. This is important because in every case where Satan falls, something dramatic happens in God's relationship with man. His first fall was from the third heaven down to the earth. All right, he was cast out down to the earth. He had access to the second heaven. In the book of Job, plainly, he could come before the Lord 
as the others, as the angels of God did. But in, but in the case of Job, it was, where, notice carefully, they came and presented themselves unto the Lord. Read that scripture very carefully and see if you can read third heaven into there. And I'm not sure you can, but you can read into that where God made himself present and known to those who came before him. Satan's cast down. The second is when he loses his authority in heaven. Look at Luke chapter 10, verse 18. Luke 10, 18. Get so much stuff on my fingers here. I can't. Uh, I can't get the paper apart. It's rough when you get fat, bald-headed, senile, and old, and get when you can't do anything. <laughs> Luke ten. <laughs> Luke ten and verse eighteen. <laughs> the Lord said, "I beheld Satan as lightning." fall from heaven. See that? Here we go. This is not Ezekiel 28. This is the second casting down. He loses authority in the second heaven. In other words, that which is above you, that the Hubble telescope. Now look at the next one, Ephesians 2.2. 2. Ephesians 2.2. 2. Chapter number 2. Ephesians 2.2. 2. When in time past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, among whom also we all had our conversation in times past in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and by nature the children of wrath, even as others, the air, all right? It's the same air that you find in the book of Daniel. When Daniel prayed and God sent and answered his prayer, but he, the, the, the angel that came as he answered his prayer had to fight his way through. He had to fight his way through, and it was in the air right above him. Now look over here in Revelation 12, 9. Revelation 12, 9. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out, where? Into the earth. And his angels cast out with him. This takes place in the tribulation. All right. This is, the, this is a gradual downfall and casting out of Satan down to the earth. This is uh, Revelation 20. Verse 1. And I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key of the bottomless pit, a great chain in his hand, and he laid hold of the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil, Satan, and bound him a thousand years and cast him into the bottomless pit. See it? He starts in the third heaven, and now he's in the bottomless pit. And each step is gradual. Down, down, down. And then in Revelation 20, verse number 10. You remember what happens when he comes out of the bottomless pit. He's there a thousand years, I mentioned a moment ago. Comes out and leads a rebellion against God. And now in Revelation 20, verse 10. The devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. That's his final casting down, like a fire. That shocks the human senses, folks. If you sit around and think about a lake of fire, if it doesn't shock your senses, I don't know what will. Whatever you understand hell to be, 
I don't see how in the world you could, you could, you could, uh, you could define or describe this any other way as to say a spirit being is brought into a place of suffering, damnation, eternity in the lake of fire and brimstone. That's a horrible thought. That's a horrible thing. The Bible said God created hell for who? The devil and his angels. He didn't make it for man. He made it for Satan and his angels. What his purpose in that is, that's in God's hand. Why God does anything, that's in God's hand. He hasn't revealed everything to us. But I firmly believe this. I believe that if you deserve to go to hell and you don't have one who can keep you out of hell, you'll wind up in hell. And the only one who can keep you out of hell is the Lord Jesus Christ. There's no other name given under heaven whereby we must be saved. So that means that you better turn to the Son of God and you better trust him. And he is alone, the only one that can keep you out of damnation and judgment is the Son of God. I'm thankful for him. I'm going to read a scripture for you here. And uh, I got this the other day and I wanted to, uh, it kind of grabbed my, grabbed my mind when I read it. And I'm going to read it for you and then we'll come to a close. Proverbs 20 verse 4, the sluggard will not plow by reason of the cold. Therefore shall he beg and harvest and have nothing. It's amazing when you read the Bible how much it has to say about work. Proverbs 13, 4. The soul of the sluggard desireth and hath nothing, but the soul of the diligent shall be made fat. And then in Proverbs 24, 30. I went by the field of the slothful and by the vineyard of the man void of understanding. And lo, it was all grown over with thorns and thistles and had covered the face thereof and the stone wall thereof was broken down. Then I saw and considered it well. I looked upon it and received instruction. Yet a little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to sleep. So shall thy poverty come as one that travaileth, and thy want as an armed man. The desire of the slothful killeth him, for his hands refuse to labor. You know how long ago that was written? 3,000 years ago. You know what that says to me? Man hasn't changed one bit in 3,000 years. Do you know anybody that won't work? <laughs> we got, I don't ever seem to like it in my life. Got signs all over the place. Now hiring, now hiring, now hiring, now hiring. All I ask for is an opportunity to do my best and go to work. And that's what God gave. I got out of the Marine Corps. I got out of the Marine Corps on Thursday, and the following Monday, I went to work because I took a vacation before I got out and found a job. Got out a few days, found me a job, and so the, when I got out, I took a long vacation from Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, and then Monday morning, I went to work. And here's my thankfulness today. I am thankful unto God that he has taken care of me and given me a place to work. The worst curse on your life is to sit around and have nothing to do. That's a curse. Yeah. It doesn't even sound good, does it? <laughs> Sluggard. It's like the German Doomkopf. No doubt what you're talking about there. <laughs> All right, we'll pray. We'll pray. <laughs> Brother Presley dismisses.